Shut up, compressor. Hey everyone, Matt here with Duke's Models, bringing you a review of the brand new 140A scale Great Wall Hobby F14B Tomcat. This is a naked build, which has nothing to do with what kind of apparel that I'm wearing or not wearing while putting it together. What it means is that this review is all about seeing how the kit builds up with what it gives you in the box and giving you a sense of what you can expect before you hit any filler, primer, paint, all that stuff that you can use to hide the sins of the actual kit itself. Before diving in, I want to thank Lionheart Hobby for providing the kit for this review. I love kicking around new kits, but I go way too slow on serious builds to possibly keep up. These naked reviews give me a, a best of both worlds and hopefully give you a clear look at fresh plastic. If you want to go buy Great Wall's F14B or any of Tamiya's excellent 140A scale F14s, I'd be thrilled if you considered doing so from Lionheart. There's a link in the description, and if you use the code dugs tomcat in all caps at checkout, you'll get free shipping on your entire order. So, what am I looking for in this kit? It's simple, really. I'm looking for a viable competitor to Tamiya's F14s. Tamiya's Tomcat is honestly one of the best 148th kits ever produced. And while it lacks some detail in the cockpit and the gear bays, it more than makes up for it with phenomenal engineering and fit. Of course, in typical Tamiya fashion, they suck at variant coverage, so while we have the mid-A and the F14D, and most recently a late F14A, there's no sign of an F14B. Which, of course, the way it would work out is that the F14B is my favorite variant of the Tomcat. Go figure. That's where Great Wall comes in. Several of Great Wall's recent kits, such as the SU-35, SU-27, and 132nd P40 are absolute world beaters. Some of the few kits in existence that I've put on a level with Tamiya's aircraft releases of the last 10 to 15 years. If anybody could bring a worthy challenge to the Tamiya Cat, Great Wall pretty much has to be on that shortlist. Now, before I dive into the build, we have to talk about the price. I typically roll my eyes when people complain about kit prices, but that's because their brains are stuck in 1980, and they can't seem to grapple with things like inflation. Cars and Cokes and, you know, pretty much everything else just cost a fuckload more now deal with it. But this is a bit different. To me, is F14's MSRP for around $130, which is already hovering at the high end of, yeah, okay, for a 140A scale jet. Great Wall has set their MSRP for their F14B at something closer to $200, which is fucking insane. Apparently, they were you know, strongly advised to keep their price under the Tamiya's, and yeah, that that didn't happen. And I think they've probably screwed themselves with that move. To me, this isn't complaining about price. This is, it's a matter of comparative value. Is the Great Wall F14 $70 better than the Tamiya kits? I mean, that's, that's a high bar to clear. And from what I experienced, well, it's a good kit. It's, it's no, it's not better than the Tamiya kit. And it's certainly not $70 better. For that $70, you could invest in a load of aftermarket goodies for the Tamiya and you know, goodies that you would still want to invest in with the Great Wall kit. So it's already got that massive headwind, but let's take a look at it. The cockpit takes a similar approach to the Tamiya kit, with the side consoles as separate parts that drop into cockpit tub blanks. The Great Wall consoles, and particularly the bulkheads, are quite a bit more detailed than you find in Tamiya's kit, but the throttle is just an embarrassment. Like, it would have been better if they just hadn't even tried. I, I don't know what this is. And while the ejection seats seem promising at first, with ambitious ideas like separate plastic for the belts, they end up kind of thick and gross and pretty inaccurate looking when you get it get it all built up. You know, you're you're gonna want resin or 3D printed replacements if you have any kind of standards at all. The nose gear bay builds up nicely, and here is where Great Wall outpaces Tamiya. The detail is quite good, and the separate plastic parts to represent some of the rat's nest of cables, wires, and various fluid lines are much appreciated. The design also makes it easy to get everything aligned, but still not have to deal with adding the full nose strut until much later. Now, there's no Academy F4 fandom bullshit going on here. The cockpit and gear bay join up and then seat into the Ford fuselage with some giant can't-fuck-it-up locating pins. Things are a bit rickety at first, and it seems ripe for disaster, but the lower pieces D6 and D1 fit in quite nicely and provide much-needed stability. There are also photo etch parts for the slime lights, which... Okay, uh... 
that can be dicey on some kits, but here they've got a little recess that they fit into just fine. But I don't see why they couldn't just be molded detail. The windscreen's clear part extends all the way forward to the radome, which is a panel line further than the Tamiya kit. This means it's a cinch to use Tamiya Extra Thin on. And that takes us up front, where we come to our first big divergence from the Tamiya kit. The Great Wall kit is very clearly designed to have the radome opened up to reveal the F-14's massive AUG-9 radar. But there are two problems with this. First, Great Wall's approach to this gives away their lion roar heritage in the, uh, the whole what if we made this whole thing out of one crazy piece of PE that you have to fold over and over and over and over again? And second, the F-14 just looks derpy as fuck with its radome opened. You know how on the F-15 and F-16 and the Hornet, the radome's all hinged to the side? The F-14 hinges up. It's the ultimate ruins the lines look. And I think there's a reason Tamiya didn't bother. I fucked around with the radar PE bullshit for about five minutes and then noped out and just glued the radome in the closed position. This sucks to do because the hinge arms aren't long enough and there's no provision for ensuring that the width and shape of the fuselage and the radome match. It's more or less a butt joint and you just kind of have to wing it. Unless you're just hot for that AUG-9, I'd consider this another strike against the Great Wall Kit. Next up, let's install the nose gear doors. I'd never install them this early in a regular build, but this ain't a regular build and the instructions say to do it here, so fuck it. Also, the instructions suggest that closing the doors up for inflight is just as easy as snipping off the open hingey bits. Quick, someone check Becker's heart rate. With that, let's jump over to the main fuselage. The main gear bays go together well, and use the same separate wiring loom bits to create a sense of busyness as the nose gear bay. I'd say it's maybe halfway between the Ken doll approach of the Tamiya kit and the rat's nest of the real thing, but it's a real time saver. The Great Wall Kit also uses actual clear parts to represent the lights above and below the glove veins. And I've got to say, after dealing with the solid plastic on the Tamiya kit, that's a nice touch. The wing spar and fold mechanism is beefy and pretty simple. There's nothing like the synchronizing gear teeth of the Tamiya kit, it's just a bar with some GoPro style mounts on either end for attaching the wing spars, which all slot down over common posts. On the one hand, this might be annoying at anything but full extension or full sweep, you know, if you can't sync the wings up. On the other, it's probably nice for the weirdos who want to pose it with one wing extended and the other wing swept. Once the spar is installed and the gear bays are installed, the upper and lower fuselage halves fit together with an audible, satisfying snap. And then it's on to building up the rest of the main airframe. The intake trunks are fine, but if you're anal, you're going to spend a bit of time cleaning up the seams. For those without their own bounty of fucks, it's honestly hard to see so far up into the intakes anyway. The only place I found frustrating on the intakes was parts I-6, which I believe are actuators for the intake louvers. They're supposed to go up through the fuselage, but it's a vague angle and it's honestly just a whole lot to ask when you're wrestling the intakes into place. Like, they fit well, but getting them into place takes some, takes some grunt work. Then there's the ventral fins. These frustrated me in two ways. First, the fins themselves. To me, as F-14s have these things just seat so well that you don't even need glue. You know, I was able to pull them off and repaint them on mine after it had already been through paint. Great Wall looked at that and said, nah, I'm not going to do that. And decided to go with a butt join and a vague depression. Now, is this a deal breaker? No, not by itself, but it's another mark in the against column. The second thing about these fins has to do with the tow hooks at the back. Great Wall provides you with both the stowed and dropped hooks, which is nice, but the instructions make it seem like a use-both situation instead of an either-or. And in my test fitting, trying to figure out what the fuck they wanted me to do there, I lost two of the four tiniest parts to the Quantum Realm and just kind of had to go with what I had left. The exhaust areas fit fine, but not as fine as Tamiya. And the exhausts themselves, I mean, the, the detail's nice, but the bisected exhaust tunnels leave an unsightly seam. Then again, you know, the quartered internal detail in the cans fits nicely inside these one-piece shells. Like, it's a pretty slick system. The only significant drawback there is that there's just no positive fit to the exhaust tunnels or to the rear of the aircraft. You know, it's all butt joins. And that means it's going to complicate detail painting since you have to consider fixing them to the jet with something more than just, you know, light pressure as you would have in the case of a Tamiya kit. All the gear struts go together well enough, but 
to me, they seem to have about twice the parts count to me as struts for just about the same level of detail. I'm not really seeing a big advantage here. And at this point, I decided to veer from the instructions a bit. You know, I didn't want to just go ahead and install all the gear doors. I wanted to see about the other key areas of the aircraft. So, moving on to the stabilators. They employ an interesting insert and twist method that holds them nice and tight to the fuselage. That's cool. But if you look closely, it doesn't hold them in a way that's aligned, and I found that my port and starboard stabilators varied massively in their in their angles from one another. Now, an aircraft with fucked up stab alignment is nothing special, but considering this is a new tool kit with the audacity to ask nearly $200, it's not a good look. The vertical tails didn't blow my skirt up either. The fit of the tails into the tail bases M1 and M2 is okay. The port tail seems to have a bit of a gap going on, and the tails just kind of sit on top of the engine with two little mounting pips. Yeah, the fit here is fine, but this kit is coming along like five years after the Tamiya F-14 showed a much more elegant way of doing things. Again, at this price point, I expect more finesse. Alright, moving on to the canopy. Here, Great Wall took the odd step of molding the canopy glass and the canopy frame as two separate pieces. Why do kit manufacturers do stupid shit like this? It's like when Academy molded its F-4B in gray and white. Like, what, people aren't going to fucking paint it? And with the Academy, I guess that's just within the realm of possibility. But here, people are going to throw down one and a half Tamiya Tomcats on a kit and then not have their shit together enough to mask a canopy? If there's like one hard and fast rule in modeling and kits, it's that any separation leads to potential fit issues. See, every resin tire with separate hubs ever made. I was braced for the worst with this canopy. But while there's certainly some wrangling to get shit into position, once it fits, it mostly fits well. There's a bit of fuckery at the forward frame, but that's it, and that was probably my fault. Still, overall this just seems like a gimmick, and a pointless one that introduces complexity for no real benefit. I'd prefer if they just stuck to one big-ass clear part and included a mask. Next, I jumped around again and landed on the wings. Great Wall helpfully gives you like 11 million options here. You can go slats up or down, flaps up or down, and spoilers up or down. Yeah, apart from takeoff and landing, you don't often see F-14s all splayed out like that. But when has that stopped us modelers? I decided this was going to get the fully splayed approach. And the wings build up mostly fine. You know, I really like how the flaps fit into the back of the wing, and the same for the slats up front. The only thing that felt a bit less than awesome was the fit of the panel just inboard of the roll spoilers. I'd give it a B plus, but it's... You know, it's worse than if they just molded that part in place and added a panel line. Like, I don't know why it's separate. And now we get to the point where a fuck-up I committed several steps back comes back to bite me in the ass. When I was installing the wing spars, I was super focused on getting the center spar facing the right direction. And in what can only be described as target fixation, <laughs> I forgot to do the same thing with the actual wing spars. And it turns out, they're directional. And... I installed them backwards. And getting them out would involve just absolutely ripping the fuselage apart, ripping the center spar out. I don't know if I'd be able to get it back in. It, it'd be a whole mess. Now, Will Pattison would chalk this up as an engineering failure. You know, critical parts like that should only be able to fit one way, which, totally fair. I, I would call this a uh, less than ideal engineering situation. At the same time, I fucked up. This one's on me. But at this point, it seems kind of pointless to continue the build. You know, if the wings can't go on without destroying the kit, why bother with the gear doors? <laughs> Besides, a really nice crew ladder isn't going to suddenly alter my opinion of the kit. So, speaking of which, what did I make of the Great Wall F-14B? As a bunch of plastic in a box, Great Wall's given us a nicely detailed F-14 that's about 90% in the fit department. I don't really feel qualified to speak to the accuracy, but apparently there are some knack events in the wrong place, and the seat cushions are all wrong, and the shape of the fuselage is a bit off. Looking at it next to my Tamiya F-14A, there's definitely some variance between the two, but my poor brain couldn't identify precisely what. Overall, I'd probably give the, the whole kit a B, which I guess for an F-14B is kind of fitting, but I'm also a big fan of context. And this kit does not exist as just a bunch of plastic in a box. It exists in a world where Tamiya's F-14s exist. Where Great Wall decided to set the MSRP around $200. 
And in that context, the Great Wall kit has the Tamiya kits beat in exactly two areas. First, it has much better gear bay detail. Not enough to satisfy the gear bay dorks out of the box, probably, but again, much better than Tamiya's Ken doll approach. Second, it's an F14B, and to date, Tamiya hasn't kitted a B variant. And that's it. In every other way that matters, the Tamiya F14s come out on top, and it's not even close. Design, engineering, fit, thoughtful features like the way the tails and the ventral fins install, all of it. If Great Wall was charging $75 or even $100 for their Bombcat, that might go away toward balancing things out, but instead they're pricing this thing like it's a fucking Range Rover. Now again, I generally don't care much about model kit prices, but this thing steps so far outside of the usual pricing bands that, to me at least, it feels insulting. It's a dick move not only to modelers, but to retailers who have to deal with this albatross. If the kit backed it up and delivered a build and a result that matched or even surpassed Tamiya's F14s, then maybe. Maybe. But it just doesn't. Ultimately, my experience with the Great Wall F14B only made me appreciate Tamiya's F14s even more. And if I were jonesing for an F14B right now, I'd almost certainly start with Tamiya's late F14A and grab the necessary aftermarket bits to make the conversion. Honestly, it'd probably still work out to less than the total cost of the Great Wall kit. I want to thank Lionheart Hobby again for providing this kit to the Sacrificial Review Altar. Unlike certain magazines and websites, I don't sugarcoat my reviews, and I'm humbled that Rudy and Danielle appreciate the value these can provide to modelers. If you're inspired to buy a Great Wall F14B, or any of Tamiya's three F14s, I hope you'll consider supporting them. And again, if you use the code DUGS, dash tomcat all caps at checkout you'll get free shipping on your entire order also i'd love to hear what you thought of this review and particularly what you think of this format versus the multi-part reviews i've done in the past what would you like more of less of your opinion matters and i'd love to hear it unless you just want to bitch about expletives and that just about wraps things up so until next time catch y'all later